everybody, and welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave, an offshoot of an offshoot of a podcast of Ice and Fire. My name is Bina 7 I'm going to be your host today, and we are discussing Star Trek Discovery Season 2, with potential spoilers for all things Discovery, as well as potentially other Star Trek series. Joining me today, I have Mary. Hey everyone, it's Mary, or Nymeria on the forums. And Jock. Hello, it's Jock, Mungo Jock Q on the forums. And the forums to which we refer are the forums of a podcast of Ice and Fire, which you can join if you want to come on on this episode and get involved with VOC. So we're here because obviously Star Trek Discovery Season 2 ended last Thursday, if you're in the States, I believe, and Friday if you're watching on Netflix in the UK. Um, it's obviously a season series that we all really enjoyed and want to talk about. But before getting into sort of lemon cakes and, and the themes and characters of the season, I wanted to ask you all, what were your expectations going into this season did you really love season one did you have particular storylines that you wanted to see in season two um sort of what what was your thinking on the direction if anything mary um i think i think with uh star trek discovery i really enjoyed season one but it's that kind of show that you really enjoy while you're watching it are you really into it and um and then a, a, a year later it's like you i barely even remembered um season one I, I remembered enjoying it but I was like eh so um, no expectations whatsoever I mean I, I I was happy to get back into science fiction because I didn't watch a lot of it uh, recently but apart from that um, really I, I wasn't expecting anything I barely remember remembered that season one ended with um, um, the Enterprise uh, appearing and I was like oh right that's where we were so yeah well, that makes it super quick because I think I'm exactly where you were. That I sort of, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed season one. I'm, I don't have a track history, but it was kind of good. Um, it wasn't like my all-time favorite show. Um, I had no real expectations going into season two. Didn't expect. Um, I kind of knew Enterprise turned up, but I had no real sort of expectation or excitement for the fact that Spock might be in it. And um, I certainly wasn't prepared. I think for how much more invested I got into season two. I mean, season one I obviously liked enough to watch season two, but season two became I think my most anticipated show, like I was definitely more excited about the season two finale this week than, or this weekend, than I was about Game of Thrones season two, uh, episode mm-hmm. two, which is kind of amazing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Jock? What were you, did you know about particular storylines or were you particularly excited about it? Um, well, I was quite ex- um, excited initially to sort of see how, um, I don't remember her name, but the Klingon, um, Green Chief and whatever. Oh, Laurel. Uh, yeah, Laurel. Um, I was interested in how she sort of managed leadership in a very sort of honour-based warrior culture. And I'm quite disappointed we sort of went a more soap opera-y out in that storyline. Oh, yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? In a show that does have very strong women, they have played that more as a as a tragic romance, although I think fairly effectively. Um, okay, so not big expectations going to the series. And remind me what your Star Trek knowledge was pre-Discovery. Do you count yourself as big Trek fans uh, prior to this, Jock? Um, I only have really enjoyed them um, next generation. Okay, but you do have some previous history. How about you, uh, Mary? Yeah, that's already better than me. Like I had, I hadn't watched any Trek series before, and ever since season one, I've I've kind of been wanting to to watch it. But it just now I feel like I I don't know if I would respond well to um, original uh, Pike and Spock after this season. Um, so I'm a bit worried. I don't know if I would uh, really enjoy going back to a show that is very, um, well, just much older and then therefore, um, which is not the same Reflecting quality, the I guess. attitudes yeah. of its time and the budgets, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kind of agree. So on the back of um, the, the first part of the finale, I did go back and watch the episodes of the original season series that deal with Captain Pike. So there's three of them. Because uh, it's all on Netflix now, because I guess they have the rights if you're international. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, it was like laughably low budget. But it was kind of interesting to see, I guess, the end story or the end game of the Captain Pike story, uh, which was actually quite dark and interesting. But yeah, I think I have this image in my head of what the original series is, which is quite camp. And, you know, little girls running around in miniskirts and 
I don't know if I really want to burst my track bubble by going back to revisit yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because even even if you can like rationally uh, realize that, well, it was ten or twenty or I don't know how many decades ago. So you understand um, the budget, and you would also understand why the storylines are um, treated differently. Um, but I'm not sure I want to uh, actually uh, see that. I agree. <laughs> Hi, this is David, David HH on the forums, and... Donna, Team Donna on the forums. And we're here to have kind of a parallel conversation. So, um, what were your expectations going into the series, Donna? Anything? I can't even remember because the season was so different from what... It was definitely different from what I expected um, yeah. by the end of it. Um, I didn't expect Pike to be joining Discovery, I thought... Mm-hmm. The Enterprise was just going to be like a cool little like first episode set up. I knew Spock was going to be involved, but I also mm-hmm. didn't realize how heavily he was going to be involved. Yeah. So I was pleasantly surprised, which I think sums up my opinions of the season. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm weird, and this will come up also in my lemon cakes because this season is so dramatically different from last season. I mean, last season was so dark, and then ended with the oh yeah, all this darkness isn't Star Trek. We're we're happy, positive, great Star Trek, like positive future. All the good guys win. Bad guys don't die unless they're like. I mean, uh, good guys don't got, die unless they're like having a heroic sacrifice. And while in theory I like that, I gotta say I loved last season and those dark twists and those dark turns and and all of the like betrayals and all that fun darkness and this season i enjoyed but it was like not at all as i was expecting it was so much different in in good ways and bad so but we'll get into that now how much do you know about trek before this and before last season I know Picard memes. <laughs> See, I'm a, I'm a total Trek junkie, I know. Um, I was never a huge fan of the original season, so I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen most of them and the animated series that came after it. But pretty much from Picard and on, Next Generation on, I've seen every episode of Trek that ever exists. So I'm, I, you could argue I'm pretty much, pretty well knowledgeable. Not not a total diehard, but, you know, loved. Yeah, like I, I've seen the occasional episode in passing. I think I mentioned mm-hmm. in season one, my, my dad, enjoys star trek and i've mm-hmm. seen a few episodes with him but it's mostly the one with the lady captain because mm-hmm. that's his voyager. favorite series voyager yep yeah which, which i don't know if that's an unpopular star trek opinion yeah or not. i'd argue it kind of is I, I, it, people would debate whether that or enterprise was their least favorite probably that was i, I liked them all so whatever <laughs> Okay, so on to your lemon cake ratings for this season, or maybe we should have your synthesized burger with hot sauce, that number one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, How many lemon cakes would you give it out of five, Jock? Um, I'd say four out of five. Okay, so four out of five is high, yeah. Yeah. Is that higher than you would have given season one? No, I never did enjoy season one. I really like pork, yeah. How about you, Mary? Mm -hmm. I'm always, I feel like I'm always enthusiastic enough to give like at least four. So, I, <laughs> so but I definitely enjoyed it more than season one. Uh, so I don't remember my lemon cakes waiting at a, <laughs> at, for season one, but uh, it, it, it should be greater than that. But I guess, yeah, four, four, four to five. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, for me, it has to be a five because of the level of enthusiasm to want to vock about it instead of trying to talk to other people about it, which really yeah. surprises me. I think season mm-hmm. one, I probably would have given like a three and a half, like it was good, but it wasn't Westworld or something that I was obsessed with. But I really got into it this season. So uh, it's hard to think for me of something I really didn't like. You know, there might be some nitpicky things or some episodes that were slower than others. But yeah, I just really loved it. Um, Lemon cakes. I'm going to give it's it's hard for me to give this a fair lemon cake ratings because I'm probably going to give it a three and a half. I feel like if I hadn't seen last season, I'd probably give it a four. But compared to that, it makes me like, you know, like it's I, I, I have to compare it and maybe I shouldn't. So maybe I'm not being fair. So I'm going to give it a three and a half. I still liked it. It was fun. It was interesting. There were there were great character moments. I love these characters so much, but I still kind of like last season. Better. How about you? 3.5, but not because of comparing it with mm-hmm. um, last season. I think it had a few issues with antagonists, mm-hmm. um, but the character moments were great. 
I like that they were trying to expand the other people that were on the bridge, but I don't think they did it enough for me to care when oh, they wanted me to care. Absolutely. Uh, so <laughs> three and a half because it could have easily been higher, but mm -hmm. they just didn't use their time wisely in some ways for me. I'll agree with that. To, we'll talk about a little more yeah. in characters because that's something I want to talk about as well. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into the themes of the season. So I listed a whole bunch of them, including AI, security versus the rule of law, time travel and free will, family relationships, religion versus science, environmental degradation. So, I mean, there's lots. I think what is good about all sci-fi is lots of stuff to think about. But again, people, this is your chance to turn back. We are going to spoil season two. So if you haven't watched it and there are some really lovely plot twists, then please stop listening. <laughs> But you don't have to, but it would be good if you did. So how did we feel? It, it feels like there were a lot of overarching... I mean, this was very much written with an overarching story arc called the Red Angel and the whole um, artificial intelligence called Control, which is going to become sentient and prove catastrophic for all species, sentient species. How did you feel about this choice of the AI plot? And uh, any thoughts and comments on this as how relevant it is to where we are now in technological development? Um, I think, well, it is it is an AI plot, but at the same time, um, it's very much personified into Captain Leland. So you can almost forget that it's it's tech. Um, I mean, don't quite, but uh, you still have one big bad guy, um, which um, which is a nice trope, I guess. I'm always kind of uncomfortable with all the AI uh, stories because I myself don't really want to think about it in the real world because I don't I don't feel like I could. I think if I think about it too much, I will just be worried and it won't bring me much uh, except from ex except for that. But here, well, like with everything in 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 the show, it's it's great. You're into it. You want to know what happens next. You're really afraid of this big control thing taking uh, taking control uh, on the entire thing. But at the same time, you also have a lot of other things to distract yourself. So it, it makes for a nice overall story, I guess. Yeah, I really loved it thematically. I think it's really on the nose at the moment with people like me stressing about the singularity. It also references mm -hmm. really nicely back to things like 2001 Space Odyssey and mm -hmm. um, HAL. And there were points in the season finale when watching it thinking, gosh, this is really visually so amazing. And it really references parts of 2001. So I love that kind of situating itself in the wide sweep of sci-fi writing and visualization. Um, and I think it was really well done. The only thing that kind of slightly, I don't know if it annoyed me but I was like AI doesn't degrade really so even if you put all this data into the future surely the AI just sits there and waits and eventually catches up with it and becomes sentient I mean it's kind of patient in a way right <laughs> yeah so what's AI what's uh sentience you know because at, at some point um the sphere data is in discovery and discovery is kind of reacting to the fact that they want to destroy it and you you gotta wonder is that like is that uh being sentient because you're aware you're being attacked and you're defending yourself a lot of things were very easy in the sense that they didn't really explain anything and it's just you have control and everything else is okay like everything um from being part a uh, computer to being um to having these this sphere data basically controlling discovery um which was a bit a bit weird mm. i feel we kind of like we need tanya silence on this one yeah she's so involved <laughs> in the topic <laughs> but anyway uh jock any thoughts on the ai theme um, yeah, well, first of all, that um, AI is AI or robots are just good villains. They're kind of like um, great for narrative in that they're humans that don't have um, pain or sleep and they're eating or any of those sort of things to slow down. The scariest thing about humans is um, our evolutionary ability for sort of stamina. So we just don't give up and we just keep on going. Other animals may be faster or worse, longer, but um, eventually they have to eat or do something whereas humans can just keep up. I think humans are still terrified by that in more media. Yeah, I agree. I'm terrified by it anyway, rationally or not. Um, yeah. But I did like it because I, I, I do get a bit weary of either a species or a person who was the big bad, like all oh, the Klingons. Or I think having AI is a convenient way of making something evil without... Um, 
having a cliche of what is evil, uh, even if I do think they cheated a little bit on how they defeated it. So one of the themes is AI, and I don't know, it to me was pretty eh, you know? I mean, we, we've had AI on, like, every sci-fi show these days, and it's kind of cliche, and I don't feel like they went any particularly brilliant or new or innovative route with it. I mean, yeah, I guess them being responsible for destroying everything was neat, but it's not like that's the first time we've seen that. So, I don't know. It just kind of, that kind of fell flat for me, which leads to the problem of the whole, like you know, that's the main antagonist, and it kind of, that whole fell flat. Like, I'd, I'd rather have had, like, Section 31 have been the antagonist than, like, a uh, computer running them. But I guess, you know, there's Starfleet, and Starfleet has to be happy, and that's our positive, you know, very traditional Star Trek. So that's where we are now. I honestly thought AI probably would have reached a further point in Star Trek <laughs> than what Control was doing. I did yeah. like the very quick explanation that the Admiral gave of like why control is so important now because it's because of the war. Like we needed an efficient mm -hmm. way to determine battle tactics and this is what we used and it's learnt all of us very, very well because we needed it to keep ourselves alive and to keep other people safe. And I like that explanation, but mm -hmm. it was two sentences in the middle of an episode that so much other stuff was happening. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean it just I don't know. It just it just was to me like just I wanted something newer, fresher, and it wasn't, so Let's talk about security versus the rule of law. And the introduction mm -hmm. of something very cool apparently in the Trek universe that I don't think we've really seen before called Section thirty one, which is the kind of black ops security division. I think Captain Pike, the dreamy Captain Pike at one point <laughs> that's his official name of the way, Dreamy Captain Pike. <laughs> At one point it says, you know, to fight the battle, if we compromise security, sorry, if we give up our security um, to, to win this, we've already lost. And I think it, it, again, is very contemporary, this idea of, you know, surveillance and secret people who are spying on us, quote unquote, for our own safety. I, I really like that. I loved, I thought it was a really cool way to bring back Georgie. But guys, how did you find this as a, as a theme and a topic and a, a way of bringing back, quote unquote, compromised characters like Ash slash Vok and, and Georgie? Well, it's uh, yeah, as as you said, it's it's a good way to to bring back characters who are not as um, ethically perfect uh, <laughs> as Pike or or even 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 Michael. Um, so it brings um, some nuance to the show. It was a bit cliche in itself. They tried with with Asher, I guess, to to put some nuance into the fact that yeah, I'm working for them because. I think it's it's an important job uh, and it should be I I'm, I should be doing it. But everyone else in well, the only one else we know in, in section thirty one uh, is Leland and Georgia. But I I think Georgia is kind of in her own category of characters. Yeah, Michelle Yeoh is just something very special. Like yeah. I kind of felt like in that season two finale when you just know she wants to beat the crap out of Leland. So you're like this is why you pay Michelle Yeoh. I'm sure they pay her a fortune, but this is why you pay her and it's to do stuff like this and and you know we were also discussing watching it like she is so internationally famous she has had a successful career earning a ton of money she doesn't need to do star trek at this point and you almost get the feeling that she's just doing it because she finds it so much fun and yeah. i really i really I think love she's that. enjoying it <laughs> yeah like way too yeah. much like i think it kind of almost ruins the performance because you just you can see through georgie to michelle yo just having the time of her life <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was incredibly fun to like, kind of all that was on screen. Like when she was fighting um, Reed and um, like just saying like in the innuendos every time they were fighting. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that whole section 31 is interesting. So I'm wondering if at the end of this season, because does section 31 exist in the sort of the pre, the kind of the Discovery or the Star Trek universe outside of Discovery? I just wonder if yeah, it's something like mean. holograms that will be banned because they'll realise it causes more trouble than it's worth. I think we need David to answer that. Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm going to add a note to get him to answer it. But um, Jock, do you know? Well, when the sort of further in the future ones, it would be definitely not because by then it's sort of gotten utopian and sort of where most of the threats are sort of outside and they're dealing more with sort of model issues um, and the guards how to deal with them um, more primitive. Um, cultures or less technically advanced societies rather than internal issues. Yeah, I did get that a little bit with um, the bits of the original series mm -hmm. that I watched that it did have a little bit that sort of patronising colonial kind of 
we are the advanced liberal wonderful utopian people and we will show these barbaric tribes how to live whereas obviously writing in 2019 it's much more about navel gazing internal oh god how we how we govern ourselves isn't how we think we govern yeah. ourselves and there's like, there's murky ambiguity under it which is i think better for our times it um, is interesting to to see how the, this the same show can be written so differently um now that it was that it was um at the time it's just we don't have the same it would be very weird to have a show where they just go off and explore uh, planets and, and encounter aliens and it just wouldn't work uh, very well, I think, in this time. Mm. I think it probably shows, however, the kind of the strength of the original concept that it can be that it can have that flexibility within it, but not break. But then I guess maybe that's why. I mean, I know there are some fans of the original shows who really violently don't like Discovery, so maybe they would disagree. Maybe it helps to come to this a bit newer as we are. Right. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of the point to uh, of Discovery. Yeah, for sure. Hence the name. Please yeah. in the title. <laughs> I know Bina wanted me to, to talk a little bit about how um, Section 31 in this universe. Um, first of all, for those who don't know, Discovery is pretty much the exact same universe as all the other Star Trek shows and the early movies. You know, there was some, there might have been some changes or whatever, but the main difference was the movies. Um, they, they split off the movies into their own like parallel timeline. And it turns out, if, if you know anything about behind the scenes, part of that was for legal reasons because Paramount and Viacom split and each of them was taking like one of them one took the movies and one took the tv shows and they had to be a certain percentage different so that's part of why they did the things they did um and i i hear that that's mostly over and that it's coming back together or something like that and either way the movies are done now because they can't afford the two chrises so it kind of doesn't matter but in the in the mainstream universe um you know it, the first time we saw section 31 was on um deep space nine and it was during a war we we had a war with the dominion which was you know bad guys from another sector of the universe shape changers and um section 31 was mainly kept around to do the dirty work that starfleet couldn't allow like it all the stuff that our morality wouldn't allow us to do you know anything from torture to you know lying to our allies to whatever that's what they were there for and and they worked well in that but they were very much like like they were uh, a legend you know we think they're there but we, you know, we didn't see them and we only saw them because we were on the front lines of the war on the TV show Deep Space Nine. Um, so we got to see some of them. And even then, they only appeared occasionally. So it, it very much was hidden and underground. And presumably we've heard that the new show that's going to be the spinoff with Michelle Yeoh and, and I'm, I'm guessing Ash there is going to go off to be on it is um, is going to be how they get to that point, you know? Yeah, I mean, I like the idea of security thirty, the security uh, section thirty one, just because Starfleet and all its high minded principles, they definitely have a dirty dark side, mm -hmm. and I like that for all their yada yada yap yap, like we're the good guys. That no, sometimes you have to do dirty dirty things, and mm -hmm. that can't be everyone in Starfleet. But if it's right. just some people who are technically part of Starfleet, but alongside and so far on the fringes that most people in Starfleet don't know they exist. I think that works really well, like, in that universe. Yeah. But, yeah, one of my issues with Section 31 was Leland, who, the actor, I, I don't dislike him, but he's played the same kind of evil character so many times that uh. as soon as he was on, I was like, oh, I've seen one season of Rain. <laughs> I've seen, like, you know, Shadowhunters. Um, the unfortunate thing is, I guess the showrunners didn't think there would be an overlap of those, like, audiences, so they could use him again to do exactly mm -hmm. the same, like, one-beat evil guy. Yeah. Uh, so as soon as he was on, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know where this is going. Although he did get a totally second beat once he was taken over by the evil computer AI. But... He was going to be evil either way. Right, right. I, I kind of, yeah. I still wish they'd just gone with them being the bad guys doing something bad, and they didn't. So, whatever. I mean, I, I guess, again, they're trying to be goody-goody Starfleet, but... And, and in the future, Section 31, it's not really 100% clear what their relation is. They're kind of not actually Starfleet, but Starfleet kind of knows they're there and lets them... Uh, it's They've tried tried to keep it really loose and and that's probably the best way to do it it would have been at least for yeah security versus rule of law like mm -hmm. what's what i feel 
like it would have worked better if control didn't have to get just kill all the humans like it mm-hmm. it would have been interesting if control manipulated all the humans in section 31 to work yeah, for it and they agreed. were okay with it mm-hmm. like they were really happy working for control yeah. instead of control just going like I don't need these flesh bags yeah. I'm going to dump them into space absolutely Abs- I agree 100% like it just became the omnipotent bad guy that we don't have any motivation for really other than humans are bad so kill them all which i don't know isn't compelling television to me you know but i mean i still liked it but mainly just because i love these characters so um time travel versus free will this is fascinating (laughs) right so we have the red angel who can time travel because of uh plot MacGuffins called time crystals but if you touch a time crystal you sort of i don't know if you touch it just a little bit like michael you don't change the future but if you touch it a lot like captain pike you crystallize your future or maybe it's the first one to touch it and and take it from wherever it was that has the impact i don't know so it's like a dragon so you sort of imprint yourself on the Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um and then there's this brilliant bit in well i don't know if it's brilliant i mean some people have nitpicked about it in the season finale where pike obviously i mean it's another reason why dreamy captain pike is obviously the best captain ever because even though he knows that by taking this time crystal he's crystallizing a horrific future for himself he still does it to save all species um (laughs) but there's a bit in the end with the admiral where he's like well if i know i can't die at this point why don't i stay here with this gigantic bomb that's about to blow up the enterprise and then we know that for some reason time will ensure that it doesn't happen um how did you guys feel about that this seems to be the portion of the whole time travel finale thing that most people have an issue with that why did the admiral have to die if time travel you know if the whole time thing is true couldn't pike have somehow just sat there with a crystal my wife thought it was just like the timeline he was going down by taking the time to film, um, which made that probability almost certain of like going down those events and those events there weren't other possible timelines that would also jeopardize his goal he went down a different route. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think, first of all, like, the... I don't I don't know... I don't remember his name, the Klingon, uh, uh, Laurel and Ash's son, who tells him, if you if you take it, you will... Um, uh, this will definitely happen. First of all, maybe he can be wrong. I don't know. Um, and well, except for this, for this part, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I, if I, if I liked it, the specific, um, well, I could stay. Um, I thought it was, um, a good, good Pike moment, you know, but apart from all that, I think throughout the whole season, they did something quite neat, which is not always the case with time travel and Indeed. <laughs> uh, events that chronologically uh, are weird. <laughs> um, but, but they they did a good job. I think they, they used this idea of time travel very well, but without going into too much, too, too many, yeah, without too much paradox, you know. Yeah, I think uh, they, they were very successful with this. Yeah, I have to say, I groan when I see time travel. Not because I don't think time mm-hmm. travel is cool, but I just think, oh, no, this is just going to be kind of, it's going to get, well, it's going to time up and yeah you, <laughs> yeah, you usually know that, I mean, at least I know that at some point I'm going to have to be, well, okay, I'm not going to think too much about it because it's just a show, but this couldn't work. <laughs> Here, here, I didn't really have to do that. Like, it's not like in, I mean, in Doctor Who, for instance, I basically turn off that part of my brain whenever <laughs> I watch it because I know it's not going to make sense. I know there's going to be a lot of inconsistencies, but what the fuck? And here, it's just, yeah, it, it works. It works quite well. Willing suspension of disbelief in full effect. Um, I yeah, I didn't feel I needed it here. I mean, apart from that final thing, and I think they get around it quite neatly where the admiral is like, well, it's too risky to try it. But then, like, when you see the blast that has destroyed like a good chunk of the Enterprise, and Captain Pike was literally just behind a blast door, and I know they're called a blast door for a reason, but still, it was kind of like he's about, really yeah, yeah, oh, still that, 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 that does like make sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't. It was kind of like why, number one, I was kind of slightly annoyed that the admiral had to die because I thought she was quite. Cool. Uh, character yeah um but admiral cornwall but i you know whatevs it's okay i will i will give it a free pass on this because i know time travel is tricky so time travel 
we get that as our major story this season and then of course the finale and you get to all of that idea of is there free will if you have time travel with Burnham becoming herself creating her future and all that I, I, it was somewhat cliche it's been done but but I enjoyed it I thought it worked well I did like the twist that she was actually her mother you know th- that her mother was was the angel and then then it turned out to be her too and all of that I kind of like that little twist I didn't see that coming her mother coming out of it which maybe I should have but I like that you I I enjoyed that part I didn't see her mum coming back I thought it would just be Burnham facing like a future version of herself that is you know has a face scar or something uh kind of thing like she's been through mm-hmm. hell I liked how they characterized her mother of going like, yeah, I am still a mother, but I've watched you die so many different ways that like I can no longer form emotional attachments for my own good. Mm-hmm. I have I have a, a directive like I, I have to do this. This is my. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but like free will and time travel is so hard because mm-hmm. I mean, philosophers get themselves into right. thought knots around it. I have to believe free will exists. I think free will exists in time travel, but I feel like you become a self-fulfilling prophecy because you already know so much about what's already happened that you mm-hmm. realize that if you're involved in the time travel, therefore you have to make those decisions and you mm-hmm. make those decisions because you're still the same person. Right. You know, you still have the same past, therefore you'll still make the same decisions. Right. So it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, Yeah. Well, one of the problems, of course, is that whenever we write about it or talk about it, it's all theory. We don't know if time travel even ex- can possibly exist. It may not. It probably makes sense that it couldn't, because realistically, you know, we'd probably destroy the universe if we figured out how to do it. So maybe it isn't. But if it is, we don't know what the rules are be- going to be, so we have to just kind of make it up as we go along, so it becomes all an exercise in philosophy. And then it just becomes, is your philosophy more interesting than mine? Can you change the past? And if you can, how would that actually work and all that stuff and and i i feel like this show did it okay you know but there was nothing like mind-blowing or shocking or even really all that innovative in the way it did it you know i mean i, I liked it like i said you know i mean i guess part of it is I'm, I'm coming off of watching um 12 monkeys and after five seasons of that and it was just so brilliantly done so like week after week after week that this was just sort of kind of generic to me and i, I know i'm being negative here and i did enjoy the season so i, I don't know how it, just the way we're talking about it just a lot of it was kind of eh to me (laughs) not so much time travel but being aware of your own future i found more Mm -hmm. interesting especially Mm -hmm. with pike and jet Mm -hmm. um because i am such a a star trek noob that i didn't realize that pike ends up in a a beep suit is it in the movies that spock like goes against starfleet and drops him off at that planet with the melissa george no it's actually it's actually in one of the episodes from the first season um what actually happened was there was a um there was a pilot they did with pike and then they decided not to use it and to recast and put kirk in um and but they wanted to save that footage because that's something they did a lot back then is reuse what you can because it was so expensive so they made a whole new episode out of it It they made it a two-parter and they filled in like the flashbacks which was Pike. So that's how that happened. And then they used, they had that, that what happened to him happened in that. Like it had already happened. And then we flash back to when they first went to this planet, which is the same place that we saw in this season. So with the same aliens. I I like that Jet and Burnham had the same future thing and i i think um what's her name tigna taro mm-hmm. yeah loved her um i i yeah her and uh like stanitz stanitz should have their own little mini series mm-hmm. for you know the trek shot yeah i would watch that oh totally uh so much um but i do think pike knowing his own future is not going to change anything because of the person that he is mm-hmm. and burnham knowing about time travel in the same way is not going to change anything because of of who she is she's not mm-hmm. going to they're both high-minded enough not to use time travel mm-hmm. or knowledge of the future for their own benefit right so they yeah. could use it for you know the universes or starfleet's benefit or something but of course of course burnham won't have that opportunity since they're in the future <laughs> Let's go to the next scene, which I put down as family relationships. So obviously we have Smock, Spock and Smock, Spock and Michael Burnham, <laughs> which is kind of, I mean, that already blows my mind a little bit because obviously Michael Burnham isn't mentioned at any other point in the canon. And it was just a first when they brought Spock back 
I know that a lot of fanboys around the world and fangirls will have been so excited, but I was kind of just a bit like, oh, really? Oh, this could go badly. But one of the things I enjoyed most in this entire season was the, maybe not all the backstory, but just the current interaction between Smok- Spock and Michael Burnham. I just thought they were a really lovely buddy act. I'm kind of sad that they're not going to be together now. Yeah, same, same. I really, um, so when I, when Pike appears and, and when eventually we find Spock, I was like, this is dangerous. Like, this is actually, you gotta, you gotta know that, that you will maybe, probably, um, be making a lot of fans very angry with that because mm. it's not the original Spock and um, it's not the original Pike. But uh, I loved it really. I think uh, they did well. Well, obviously I don't I don't know the originals, so I can't really compare. But Spock and Michael did really work very well together. Yeah, they they did so well with the casting of both Pike and Spock, and I think that, mm-hmm. like looking back on it in retrospect, I guess I didn't really understand how I can't. I mean, I of course they know how iconic Spock is, but like the balls it must take on this on the pro producers to say, right, we're going to bring back Spock and we're going to show him as a faintly emo, traumatized kid, and um, you know, just do something really radical with him. Mm-hmm. Like he looks different. He's got the beard. You know, he's he's acting. Mm-hmm. He's young. He's not because Leonard Nimoy. The shock for me was watching the original series. Like, Lena Nimoy starts off, like, super old. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a very different Spock that we've seen. Well, I, I think, I guess the beard was a really clever way to, like, yeah, obviously it's not the same guy, but you make him look sufficiently different uh, so that it's not it's not as much as a problem. Mm, yeah. Jock, how did you find uh, Spock 2.0 or prequel Spock or teen Spock? I loved um, Baby Spock. It was so cute. Yeah. Um, modern Spock was what they did. Did you like? Well, did you like the way they used as a plot point? I don't know how politically correct or incorrect this is. The idea that his um, learning disability is what made him particularly open to being spoken to and interpreting the Red Angel signals. Was that a little bit weird? Don't know. Yeah, I don't know. There's this whole thing in England right now where. Quite rightly, the British Film Institute and others are saying you shouldn't use um, learning disorders or differently as kind of plot points. The whole kind yeah, of... Yeah, definitely have a lot of autism, they're kind of going overboard with that. Yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. I don't care. I love Burnham and Spock. Like, the it, bit where they yeah, sit it, down and play chess with each other, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. so good. Sorry, Mary. It didn't bother me. Yeah, no, I, I didn't really... Um, it, did done, it didn't bother me, but, but I could I couldn't understand why it could bother some people... Um, it was sufficiently small and discreet to not be that much of a, of a plot point. But mm. So let's move on to Burnham and Spock, because that's probably most of what we have to talk about. I mean, you know, it's interesting how Spock really hovered over the entire season. Even the half a season he wasn't on. I mean, he was like the focus of every single episode, right? And Burnham's past, and we get the whole, you know, which was controversial because it's like in the first, you know, a lot of the fans at the beginning were very upset that we're retconning her into Spock's history and how, why did no one ever talk about it? Which, of course, we get the answer to at the, at the end. But I love their whole relationship and how it was, you know, bitter and fractured and them coming back together finally. I, I just love their story. I thought it was so good. And I think it was a very good sibling dynamic of the damage that you do to each other as children. Mm -hmm. You hold on to that as adults and it Mm -hmm. takes a lot to work past that. Um, And especially in the the Vulcan culture, both of them Mm -hmm. denying parts of themselves to Mm -hmm. fit in. Um, And trying to protect each other too. You know, yeah. doing doing things that hurt each other to protect them, which was messed up, but but very human, even for Spock. <laughs> yeah, I I enjoyed their entire family dynamic, even with um Sarek mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Amanda. Yeah, um, that worked really well. Uh, it was mm-hmm. yeah, uh, one of the highlights. I. It was so weird seeing shaved Spock at the end. <laughs> yep. Well, I, you know, I'll, I got to say. Liked it. I liked it. I, I did enjoy it. Um, it was just, I wasn't expecting that to be the, the full color. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed mm-hmm. him walking onto 
I keep saying bridge, but I think it might be brig. I don't know. No, it was a bridge. It was a bridge. Bridge. Oh, a bridge. oh look at me do well. Huh. <laughs> um, oh, you know, the brig's the bad place. Right. The brig's the jail. But yes. I'll say this. I don't know which was more distracting for me through the entire season. Having bearded Spock, including the little joke when <laughs> when um, <laughs> when Burnham says to him, do you really think that beard works for you? is working for you? <laughs> but I, don't, I didn't know if I found it more distracting that Spock just had that big, huge beard that just was weird on him, or that I really thought Spock was kind of hot all through the season. I was like, I don't know which was more distracting to me. Like, every time I'm looking at Spock, I'm like, I shouldn't think you're hot, but you are. <laughs> Sorry, this it's is Spock. Right. Uh, this is Spock. Zachary Quinter, I'm very comfortable with finding right. Spock that, that's, attractive when I know I shouldn't. That's fair. That's fair. But at least this yeah, version I, of Spock. Like, it was just, because this is the original Spock, I was like... That's just weird, but he's hot. Although I did, I gotta say, I thought sh the shaved version, of, even though the man's actually handsome, I don't. Did they CGI his face or something to make it look more like Nimoy? Because his face looked weird shaved there. It and, looked longer. Yeah, and it didn't look like his real face. Like I've seen pictures of. Maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. It just that was weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like this was like the last time we we're gonna see him, and they're like, if we just make it, like maybe that's why they got mm -hmm. he he had the beard because they liked his version of Spock, but mm -hmm. he looked so. different different that they're like oh god get him to grow a beard and mm -hmm. people won't notice it as much right because i feel like he grew an extra chin <laughs> like yeah. it just it was it felt like a completely different jawline maybe it was just the uniform <laughs> maybe was slimming into his face or lengthening of his face or whatever i don't know it was weird <laughs> <laughs> but yeah hey, we've got it we've got it very good we're Krakens. We have to turn everything into fashion cast, right? Yeah, fashion. <laughs> I mean, I do like Spock's development all through the season also. Like, you know, as him dealing with his emotions and dealing with the fact that he's dealing with something that in many ways is faith to him because he believes in this angel but doesn't know what it is and it makes no sense whatsoever and he's supposed to be a creature of logic and how that impacted on his childhood and his adulthood and, I mean, sentiment, you know, he put himself into you know, and it was an asylum or, you know, something to that effect had himself yeah, he, he checked himself as an inpatient but right. I what I loved about that is is Spock in the most total Spock way when he came in and told him about that he was like oh cool I'm not crazy I'm leaving thanks okay <laughs> that's yeah. very Spock right <laughs> yeah it was like no no I, I've been proven correct I don't actually need to be in here I'm not crazy at all thank you <laughs> And, and the faith that um, Burnham had that, in fact, you know, he wasn't, that he didn't kill them, that, that I believe him. Now, admittedly, she mind-melded and saw it, too. But, you know, she did believe him, and, and she was right. So <laughs> even with evidence that was tampered with. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Burnham was a much more emotional character this season, mm -hmm. understandably, yep. which I liked. I, I did, mm -hmm. did enjoy that. It, it was kind of one of those, like, she's learned from season one mm -hmm. and this season – where it's appropriate showing emotion and relying on your emotions mm -hmm. is the correct thing. And especially, I mean, as much as last season was about her story, I mean, this season was really uh, about her character and her history and her life. I mean, you know, this wasn't a mission that we're going on. This was me, my mother, my brother, my family my history, my everything about her. And she has to deal with the mistakes she's made, the mistakes she's going to make, the mistakes her mother made. I mean, it doesn't get more personal than that, right? And then in the middle of that, we have Ash showing up out of the blue and she still loves him, but is bitter. And oh, he has a kid and, and, and everything else, you know? I mean, it was, it was a very, I mean, almost everything interesting that happened in the entire season revolved around her with a few exceptions. And, and I would say that was less the case in the first season, but still was. <laughs> yeah. And then there are lots of other family relationships. So, for instance, there is the family relationship between Stamets and Culber. And I did have a major issue with the end of season one when they killed off Culber. And I was like, oh, you get one gay couple and, of course, they can't be happy. And then they bring him back. And I was like, oh, well, I shouldn't have rushed to judgment. And that was me being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> how did you like the story handling, you know, a man literally brought back from the dead and how that might impact his uh, family relationship? Um, I liked that at the beginning, but I kind of didn't like the sort of breaking up that even though they handled the getting back together very well and they thought the, that was very sweet in the hospital with that scene. But I'm not quite sure why they sort of broke up. This kind of happened. I think the idea is that Culb is so changed by his literal death experience that the trauma that he's carrying with him, he can't go back to this old life of Stamets seeing him as the husband as he was. 
and that he just needs time to center himself and that it's almost like Stamets and he need to fall in love again because he's such a different like there's there's a experience that you can have that's so that's so life-changing for you that it's almost like you've got that person needs to re-fall in love with a different you and vice versa does that make sense yeah. it it does make sense I think there's also a point in in the in the show that um some things are actually like imprinted on your actual physical body and he's like it's not it's not the same body anymore I'm still me but I he remembers loving uh, Stamets but he doesn't feel the actual feeling yet um, and it was it was interestingly um, handled mm. um, it was sad <laughs> And even even for for Stamets, it's actually super weird because he yeah. actually mourned the guy he was at his at his funeral, and now he's back. It it's gotta be um a very weird to go back to your normal relationship after that. So it's actually I think it's it's a good thing that it it did take a few episodes uh, for them to to be together in a more normal way. It really reminded me of two things. It reminded me of um. I don't know if any of you watched the Battlestar Galactica remake, but they have a, a story in which there is a couple and one of them goes through a very traumatic experience on a planet. And when they are reunited, because she's been through this trauma, she breaks off the relationship because she just feels so different that this love relationship just, it's kind of almost like it was with a different person. And that was done very well too. So I think it really reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing it really reminded me of and why I loved how they did it was, I remember when I was growing up in the 80s, you'd often have, because um, sadly that was the time hostage crises where people would be um, kidnapped and held for one year, two years, three years longer until they were released. And there's a case of someone called John McCarthy. He was a British journalist and he was held for a long time. So my, my memory of that was always his fiance on the, on the news campaigning for his release at a time when we didn't, as a country, negotiate with terrorists. And then finally, finally, he gets let out of um, his hostage crisis and comes back to England. And the whole it's almost like the whole country is looking for this lovely reunion between him and his faithful um, fiance and of course they very soon break up as a couple because he's so traumatised and so changed by this that he can't get together. So unlike you I think I'm the opposite of you Jock where I really liked the idea that Culber and Stamets um, wouldn't be together because it was so traumatic and I almost mm -hmm. didn't like the fact that they got together in the end in the hospital scene like it almost felt too easy even though of course I'm pleased they're together for Discovery season three I just I don't know I just felt they'd done such good work in showing the trauma it was like oh okay so we're back together now but maybe a life and death situation then is kind of the bump that undoes it all a lot a lot of things are like that in Discovery I, I feel like um like when they brought back Colbert, I was like, well, yeah, of course I'm happy he's alive. And yes, it was bad to kill off your only gay couple. But between that and the fact that Saru is supposedly dying for a whole episode and then, oh, no, he's actually alive. Oh, um, my God, that was so emotional. <laughs> that killed me. Like, I didn't want him to die, but I felt like, Stamets, I'd gone through his death and mourned him and I was crying and then they bring him back and it's just like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm well, so pleased he's back but it's like oh man you guys you bastards you, you really put me through the ringer <laughs> well I'm, I, I gotta say it's it's in a sense quote unquote good that some some characters actually died because otherwise it would just be a little bit too easy um yeah yeah I agree like you have to show there are some stakes and some people can die I guess um mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, Stamets and Culver, I don't know. That, to me, was a whole weird storyline this year. I mean, we, we finally add Culver there to the opening credits, and he, we bring him back, like, a few episodes in, and the storyline was just weird. Like, I, I guess they were trying to eventually get us to the, no, no, their true love will win out in the end, but it just took so long to get there that by the time it happened, I was kind of, like, over it. Oh, it felt like a cop-out by the end. Yeah, if it you happened know. about three episodes earlier after Culber had um, speaking, speaking, spoken to Admiral Cornwall, mm -hmm. I was on board for it then. By mm -hmm. the time he was like, no, I just decided, like, I took the job of the Enterprise and I, then I decided mm -hmm. you're my home and I'll do anything for you. Right. Um, it, it came out of nowhere almost, you know? It was like, yeah, because mm -hmm. it, it felt like they had both made their decision and mm -hmm. he was like, no, no, change my mind, which is fine to change your mind. It's just... Mm -hmm. It didn't yeah. feel earned. It just didn't feel earned. Yeah, the entire season, I was like, the complaint after season one was, you know, you, 
that when you know they always kill off one person in a you know non-straight couple mm-hmm. essentially right um and then to bring them back just to break them up no f you right. like I, I spent like i did like colba what he was going through mm-hmm. and and that made sense and i really liked that but a lot of the season felt like a middle finger like oh you didn't want him to die now he's not dead but they're not together Suck yeah him. yeah I, um, I don't know it wasn't even that it just none of it like felt a middle finger. none of it felt earned to me none of it felt real that was i think i think it was like we we need to put some we have to have some intercharacter like tension in in the show so let's give it to them and it just didn't make sense to me i guess you know you died you came back it's something new i guess i can't really relate to that i admit but like so that's going to make you decide you don't want to be with the person you love like i I don't even understand how that would work i guess because i haven't died and come back to life but uh, it just it just didn't feel right to me you know i mean i still like the characters i mean we didn't really still get very much of culber most of the season but then again we didn't really get all that much of stamets this season i mean you know after last season he was in almost every other scene he seemed to be like a really supporting character this time and i I don't know i mean even you know outside of the relationship like i think part of it's because they don't know what to do with him because he's not really running the score drive anymore so except he is but he isn't yeah exactly what i think The other family relationship I was thinking of is between kind of Ash and Laurel and their son. So this idea that he obviously loves Michael, but he has become a parent with a Klingon woman who clearly loves him. And and yet they have this full grown son who becomes this hardcore time priest who's now fully grown, which is all very weird. How did you like the Ash and Laurel relationship? No, I, I didn't like him the first episode, but I sort of came to like it later on. It's also quite interesting with the whole where does folk end and Ashen begin. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, like, are they both distinct entities within him and does like both have feelings for her, but Ashen's um, just more in control at the moment and has feelings for Michael. I wonder if that will be a plot point in the future. Well, I mean, they've blasted into the future now, right? So I guess they're, um, yeah, that's the end of that. It's uh, interesting, though. I find Ash is a character that I really didn't get on with last season. And even this season, I'm not that into him, but I know he's quite a fan favourite. In general, I find that a criticism I would make of this season is that it's all so about the the emotional traumas of Michael. So her relationship with her mum is traumatic, and the relationship with Spock is traumatic, and the relationship with Ash is traumatic. And, like, you could almost do, like, a jokey meme about how every single episode she has to cry at some point. So I just feel that it was all a bit much for me. Like, I needed to see her have some fun and some joy at some point, you know, in the way that Tilly can be sad in one point, but but also be kind of funny in others. But I don't know. Um, Mary, any thoughts on the Ash Laurel parenting, Um, (laughs) co-parenting? Consciously uncoupled, but consciously (laughs) parenting. (laughs) Nothing more uh, than what you said. (laughs) So speaking of characters who didn't get much time, Ash and Laurel. <laughs> like, did did you feel like they were just trying to find excuses to keep him on the show? Like, because they want to use him in the sec- in the Section 31 spinoff and they, they don't want him to get another job. So they, they just threw him in. <laughs> I, I think he ended up working quite well by the later part of the season, but the early part of the season... Well, he wasn't Didn't. in a lot. Of, he wasn't in a lot of the early part of the season. <laughs> no, but he was around, like, and he was like in Section Thirty One and doing right. that kind of stuff, and right. you know, gave up his son and right. a you few know, episodes. Yeah, yeah. I, I did like yeah. the bit, the bit that the one little episode where we got to find out about the son and all that. I did like that part. You know? I liked Colba punching him. <laughs> yes, and that was that was earned. <laughs> yes, and it was a really good character moment because Ash mm-hmm. is like, oh yeah, you have every right to punch me and I am not going to punch back. Right. Like, you know, have mm-hmm. at me. Mm-hmm. It's your right. But mm-hmm. yeah, by the end of the season, it, it works. Maybe they were just, yeah, keeping him on as a reoccurring so they he wouldn't get another job but yeah with all the emotional stuff that was happening i i liked that for all the struggle that was between them in season one and a little bit in the beginning of season two by the end of it they knew where each other was at at least with um ash and in burnham mm-hmm. um but ash and laurel i hey and let's have one more I fling. because it was like that, that was yeah like no, no, I still have, wait, can like we give a... you can we have one more fling before you disappear into a time warp <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um just to make it, a, just so we can cry a little more, so we can have one more moment. Yeah. 
Because I got to say, that whole, like, penultimate episode where they did the whole, like, letters back to home and, you know, where where um Burnham had to say goodbye to Amanda and all that. That was, I, I mean, I have to admit, I bawled through, like, half the episode. <laughs> At least the last half, that whole part where they were, you know, saying goodbye and doing what they had to do. And, and, I, and I have to say, I absolutely love Burnham Scared. That was really good, too. So that whole, speaking of character stuff, and, of course, Ash having to say goodbye to them. And not staying on board because he couldn't or shouldn't. I don't know. That was all interesting. Yeah, and I can understand why. You cannot have Jojo at the head of Section 31. True, true. You, you just, you can't. That is not safe for the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did like, yeah, Ash and Lorelle, I, I thought it was a good adult relationship. It's like, you know what? This isn't working for certain reasons. And mm-hmm. it was working. <laughs> no, it's not working. Well, it isn't and... working because I'm not that person anymore because I have another yes. personality imprinted on me. I, I'd like but it like, to work, Lorelle but I'm not him. <laughs> but, and they also work well together mm-hmm. even when not in a romantic relationship. Right. Although you can tell she still wants to do that. Yeah, you can know. I, can I say one thing, though? I would love to have just one baby on a science fiction show that doesn't miraculously age to adulthood. Like, every <laughs> single time a major character on any sci-fi show, within, like, a season, they're going to be an adult. Or at least, like, an older child. Like, because we can't just have a baby on the show. It has it's to be because no one likes adult. babies. Like, it, it's just so freaking cliche. Like, the moment he said that he was the baby, I was just like, oh, God, you went there. God, no. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> anyway, I, I luckily have not watched enough sci-fi. Oh, it's like, so when you point it out, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, super tropey. Uh, but so tro- I haven't watched enough sci-fi for it to make my make me roll my eyes as soon as I see it. I mm-hmm. It worked well in, in this se- series. Um, but once again, haven't watched enough sci-fi to be like, uh, uh. I mean, they gave a good reason for it, but like, just no, I just, I, that could have been anyone. It didn't need to be the kid, and it just, uh. <laughs> I, I guess it gives them an excuse for them to never really go for the kid, because yeah, we we had the excuse we needed to protect him, but well, now he's adult anyway, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Okay, then another theme was, um, actually, in a family relationship, I was almost like jokingly thinking, it's also about the family that is Discovery. And I was going back and watching some early episodes of the season. And the first episode is really about Pike learning to trust the Discovery family, like when they're crashing into the planet and his escape pod isn't working. And they're like, Discovery has got you. Discovery is a family. And I was like, yeah. But it brings up mm-hmm. another point. Another of these people married, right? So if you're on a Star Trek ship, right? And you don't have, can you only have a relationship on board? And what if you fall in love with someone and get married and have a kid? Is that allowed? And if, and what, I mean, is Pike not married somewhere else? Do you basically choose a life in Starfleet and then you can't get married is what I'm asking. I think you could just ask to be reassigned not on a ship and somewhere you can actually have a, a relationship, I think, maybe. Uh, but it does it does look like most of them have kind of decided to be in this life or for all their life. And it's it's a weird decision. So I mean, Dreamy Captain Pike is not married? Well, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> I find Sadly, that such a waste. Oh. Yeah, that's such a waste. <laughs> yeah. But also, but in general, I think that's such a huge commitment to enter stuff. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I guess it is the commitment. There's a point at which maybe Saru says it, maybe Pike says it, that we know when we enter Starfleet that ultimately we could end up losing our lives and not seeing our families ever again. But wow, that's, that's deep, man. That's a lot. I'm not sure I would do that. One thing Bina asked me about is what happens with like sex and particularly marriage and can you be married in Starfleet and how do you have kids and how does that work and it's something they've kind of skirted around on the on all the different series of the show. I mean they don't think they even talked about it at all on Classic Trek. Next Gen they brought up the idea that these were giant ships now and that people would raise families and we saw like kids running around here and there in a school and things like that. But you know none of the main characters really worse you didn't deal with that you know it's 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 star trek so we have to have a positive happy future and wait wait wait. i I just have to interject here because uh Mm -hmm. what families totally limiting your chance to being uh promoted to the bridge well that just sounds like you know what happens to women that that was exactly Um... what i was going to bring up next is that (laughs) so you know in this happy ideal world you know we're all going to get along but realistically what's going to happen when you know someone's promoted to lieutenant commander and is moved to a different ship 
And what does that do for that person's spouse's career? You know, well, we're going to have to give you a, and, and presumably they'll find you a job there. But, you know, that's not always the best thing. And I guess, you know, I mean, let's remember Starfleet is military. They are military and they're supposed to go where they're assigned and do what they're supposed to. But we're also trying to make it this kind of happy world where we can have families and kids and all that. And they've kind of just skirted around it. Um, they did deal with it a little directly in that um, one of the minor characters, uh, Miles O'Brien, who was the um, transporter operator in the next generation um actually m married a character on the show keiko and they actually spun off onto D deep space nine and became ma uh, well she he became a major character there and they moved over and had a kid and lived on there but of course that was on a space station which is a little better than like being on a ship going all throughout the universe so you know they dealt with it a little bit there but other than that it's really been kind of you know they've they've said it works out but they haven't really shown us the details and it, in the real world, I can't imagine it really works as well as they want to pretend it does. But, you know, it's TV, so we'll just have to pretend, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the Orville has kind of addressed it. They, you know, their doctor character has two sons uh, on on board with her. Mm -hmm. I guess te technically it would just depend on what the ship was being used for. If it's right. military, no. But if it's mm -hmm. one of those like, oh, this is we're in space that is heavily colonized and everyone's on our team. If people have right. families, that's fine. Right. You're never going to be needed to go off. This is just, you know, right. here. But Starfleet is ultimately the military branch of the government, and that is their yeah. job. So they are, you know, the army. They try to make it seem nicer because we're, you know, I mean, especially on the original two shows, they were ships of exploration, not, you know, war. But ultimately, if a war is going to happen, that's what's going. <laughs> I mean, I know there, there were a couple of scenes, I think, on Next Gen where where they did go into a fight and they split off the saucer section, which was kind of, you know, where the people live. So they like move the families out of the war way. But, you know, but that was, of course, like for an episode, not for you know three years of, of a war. So again, let's try not to think about it, I think is the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next theme is religion versus science, which really comes up in the episode on Terralysium where you have a bunch of people who mysteriously time traveled into or flew to some place from Earth before World or during World War Three. They've created a religion that's kind of a composite of all the Earth religions, and to them, science seems magical. I'm not sure if there's anything more to say about that. But I liked the idea of kind of making that point that religion and science don't have to be opposed, it's just a different perspective on it. But how did you feel about the fact that they left the dude there who knew about them? And I was like, take him with you. What the fuck? Yeah, it doesn't you know, like invalidate like the whole thing of you know um even people who know um about what technology in pre what societies. And yet like it's like we won't tell the society that, you know, other species and technologies exist, they have to find it organically. I respect that. But you've got a guy who does know and you've just given him like modern technology in the form of this power cell that can last for another hundred years or whatever. I just felt that and they made it convenient for themselves as writers because he himself was like, it's cool. I have this knowledge now. I can stay. So it just kind of took the decision away from them. But I felt that was a, a real cop out. I don't understand how anyone stuck in some like mid, you know, medieval type bombed out church with no technology would see people fricking, you know, materialize in front of him with all manner of cool technology and not be like, take me with you to the synthesizing burgers with hot sauce. <laughs> Well, there's a difference between uh, seeing them, I mean, knowing that there's all this technology and actually experience it day to day. I would imagine that like, he knows it exists, but it's not, it's not the same shock as um, actually going on discovery and living the same life. Okay. And it does, a, it does a family also. Religion versus, Religion versus science. science. I, don't, I don't know. I don't have too much to say about that. Do you? Not really. I, I mean, I, I guess in in some of the earlier episodes, you, you got a lot more of the Klingon religion and how mm -hmm. that's changing to fit with the times. Mm -hmm. And in the final episode, they were like, "Yeah, no, we're, we're here for everyone's survival because everyone's survival means our survival." So right. um, that fits within our religion. Mm -hmm. right. um, you also had the Klingon uh, time crystal planet that was, <laughs> uh, yep. yeah, a, a monastery essentially, which was very cool. Um, mm -hmm. I liked that episode. I thought that was just interesting in, in how they were like, yeah, we tried. We, we, we tried to 
put these to our benefit, but it was too difficult and bad things happened. So no touching all this knowledge. It's just going to be a certain group of people who are trained to deal with how horrifying knowing your future is. Um, yeah. But, um, and then we that, did get, we did get some religion too with uh, Saru's people. Um, yes. Yeah, actually. Sorry. Completely right. forgot that. Right. We I got, liked and, that. Did um, you see the short treks by the way? Yes, I did. Okay. Cause, um, cause we got I, I some liked, of it in there too. Yeah, and with family relationships as well, why would they allow... Oh, I guess with Saru it's slightly different because his people weren't there yet that right. he couldn't tell his sister. Right. And that's why, because it would go against their directive. Right. He When he agreed uh, to come aboard, which they never should have let him, realistically, you know, he had to agree to leave everyone behind and never see them again or else you would completely change their entire future, which, oh yeah, we did anyways. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did like, I did really like that storyline of mm -hmm. Saru not only just rebelling against his religion, but essentially making a Protestant reformation <laughs> in the way of just going like, mm -hmm. look at me lo lo lose my like ganglia and mm -hmm. how, you know, religion being used on them to keep them mm -hmm. docile and... Yep not the apex predator that they originally were. And not only that, but he also went against Starfleet protocols. Everything he did in that episode was really inappropriate and he should be, you know, heavily disciplined for, but ultimately it was the right thing. You know, it's all good in theory to say, hey, you can't mess with the planet's future, but when it's your own planet and your own family and they're being oppressed, you know, it's like if Hitler was running your co your your country, you know, and I said, sorry, you can't change the future, you're not going to probably look at it so, you know, dispassionately. Exactly. And, and especially because it was a, a people with higher technology using that against others i yep. feel like starfleet mm -hmm. should have like stepped in a long right. time beforehand because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter when you have sure those people don't know about starfleet but they're being oppressed there's a reason that they don't they're not being told about starfleet and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff and, and the wider world it's it's to keep them right. as food mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. uh where kind of makes me feel a whole a little bit weird because yeah mm -hmm. if you have people who are using a superior technology against others that don't that is when you step in it's not about the people who are being oppressed it's about the oppressors right. because they know and they are using your own directive against you right knowing that you won't go against it right well, the whole, the whole point of the Prime Directive is to say we're not going to use our superior knowledge and, you know, our morality to affect the natural course of another people. But there's already someone else doing that. So if you put, if anything, interfering here puts them back on their actual natural course. So you could argue that Saru actually did the right thing in terms of Starfleet morality, although maybe the rules wouldn't agree with that. I, I think mm. he did, you know, because he I mean, this is what they should have been. It was only these other people using their superior technolo technology, yeah, technology to to oppress them. So they just yeah, put and things it's right. Really, and it's really difficult in this example, because uh, I don't want to say false religion, because that sounds cruel to all religion. But mm -hmm. they used they made up a religion to oppress people. Right. And when they were looking at the sphere data of, of the population and, and how it changed. Um, on that episode, it, it made it very, very clear that they were not on religion's side. There, there's like, no, science versus religion. Science wins in this case because religion is just leading to deaths and all this horrible stuff, which is a little bit unfair. Right. I mean, it's not even really their yeah. religion. It was an enforced religion to some extent. Yeah, and exactly. So... And after a couple of generations, who remembers the before times? <laughs> And then my final theme was environmental degradation, which I felt was the mycelial network, Tilly's little sidekick, freaky school child person, and the idea that every time they they use the spore drive, they degrade the mycelial network. I'm not sure if there's much to say about that other than I thought it was, I guess, an on-the-nose uh, kind of analogy to another modern issue that we're facing. The the moment where when when Stamets realizes that he's actually hurting a civilization in a sense it's a uh, it's quite strike quite striking and um it was yeah it was handled well i love the fact that in in just 13 45 minute episodes a 
as themes, we've covered AI, security versus the rule of law, time travel, environmental. I mean, these guys, and there's a lot of plot in these episodes. They, they've managed to pack in a lot. And even if they're only doing lightly, I think it really shows the ambition of the series. Um, I really yeah, love that. It's, yeah, it's interesting because um, they don't make the mistake of going too far into these themes. These themes, sorry, because you, it's not, it's not like you, you can really bring an answer or, um, but just they are there and you can think about that and it's, um, it's yeah. It's not too much. Done. Yeah, and I yeah. was kind of contrasting it a lot with Westworld because mm-hmm. they touch on some of these sort of technology and philosophy uh, points as well. And I was thinking, my God, with Westworld, which is a show I really super admire and enjoy and love, but it's so heavy. I mean, I always feel that consciousness that Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan are very clever and they want you to know that they're very clever and they've thought about this very deeply. And yeah. With Star Trek, it's like a lot of the same stuff is discussed and it's done really smart in a really smart way. But you can still have a scene where Tilly is kind of like getting really shy with dreamy Captain Pike and trying to tell him that he needs to move his pinky finger on the scanner because she really fancies him. And like she's kind of getting all goofy (laughs) and he's like cracking up laughing at how awkward she's being. And like you can have these two things, right? Yeah. I love Tilly so much. Sadly, I would probably be Tilly in real life if I were on a starship. There's no probably for me. I I wouldn't be exactly like that. (laughs) Oh dear. Okay, so anything else thematic anyone wants to discuss or sort of story arcs before we get into characters more? Or we've done a lot of character already. Um, I guess we can just just say um, that they, in in a sense, they close the door. I don't know if they actually close the door, but the idea is that Discovery will be in the future and that uh, it, it solves all the problems, all the inconsistencies with the actual Star Trek canon that Michael doesn't exist and the Discovery is never mentioned. So they they did that, uh, which makes me sad because it seems like it's actually closing the door on them uh, coming back somehow. I really like the kind of the rather clunky Basil exposition of, okay, we better have a scene in San Francisco now where all the senior people get together and lie about the fact that Discovery kind of went to the future and that yeah. whole like solve all the problems. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, it was quite funny and you got, you really got some great number one moments in there. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, seriously, like there's no crossovers in the future. Uh, that made me sad. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was neatly done. So, mm-hmm. which takes us to um, characters. So we've done a lot about different characters already. I feel we can give Saru some more love, though. Yeah, yeah, Saru um, hasn't got enough love already. Well, the whole Discovery crew, actually, is, um, like, most of these characters, you don't know very much about them, but but they work really well all together. Like, it's just, um, it's a big family, which is which is kind of nice. They did, they did that quite well, I think. Who's yeah. your favourite minor character of the sort of more... Um, more second string characters maybe this should be the second string character session so i can definitely say that for me i love the character of reno played by tig notaro this very deadpan engineer just very mm -hmm. funny very dry very good at her job no nonsense but just hilarious to me You know, one of the questions being asked was, are there any other characters we haven't discussed that you want to discuss more? And I would go back into, of course, Tignataro as Jet Reno. I think she was one of the best characters in the season. You know, it's funny. We've had an entire cast that's been through two years of this show now, right? And could you name any of them? I mean, other than Arium who died. <laughs> if I asked you, can you name anyone on that bridge crew that isn't in the main cast, like the main, like three? Could you, could you name any of them? I can't, <laughs> honestly. But, but yeah, Jet no, th- Reno was awesome. This is a pause for thinking. Right, I can't. No. Detmer, because she was mentioned a few times by name and she got a little more to do, and that would be it, of all of them. Like, Arium now, only because they gave her an entire episode, but I didn't know her name before that episode, and in fact, we never knew anything about her until that episode. Mm. But we take yeah, the Yeah, even tar- like the head of security had like a massive storyline, and I can't, this season, and who? I can't name her. Who? <laughs> I mean, I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, the one with the weird mouth things. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, That's right, how right, I right, think. right, right. Well, no, she didn't, I don't think she came in till this season. I don't think she existed. Yeah, before. I know, right, but right. she had like two episodes that right. she was a main she, player in. Right, She had, but she actually got more than I think any of the ones on the bridge crew. Like, she got more to do, mm. and, and Tig Notaro's Jet Reno got a lot to do, and I liked both of them a lot. In fact, they, they were, I think, they, they eclipsed any of the main ca- you know the other cast members from last season they brought these two new characters mm. in and they were both actually kind of interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like um jet reader because 
her idea of sacrifice mm -hmm. is so much better than Burnham's because Burnham is, is all about like that self-sacrifice thing. Right. She has to die or suffer for other people mm -hmm. to live where, where Jet Reader, like the entire time through, like when, when they meet her and she's like, oh no, I've been keeping everyone alive. Like her sacrifice right. is her time and her hard work right. and keeping others alive that way. And even in, in the final couple of episodes where she's like, get out of the room. I can mm -hmm. deal with this. Like right. I've and got she, it. And she's so deadpan and so just says what she thinks. You know, if the cup's half empty, let's let's talk about it. You know, this is where yeah. we are. Let's do what we have to do. And if we die, we die. Like, you know, whatever. I, I, I liked her yeah. a lot. You know, and, and I liked and I liked her little like trying to um, trying to bond with Culber and Stamets a little bit. I like that too, especially in the "I still hate you" with Stamets. You know? Yeah, <laughs> the best final handshake of like you know, you know? that there was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it, when they were like, "Oh, we're gonna go with you," like the entire bridge with mm -hmm. Burnham, I didn't care yep. at all. Mm -hmm. Like I, I knew it was meant to be like a big like we're all in mm -hmm. this together moment, but yep. I I don't know who they are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, it's I why mean, they make them look all different. So I can either either refer right, to like you right. know. I mean, I hate to say, I it, but kind you know, of know what their jobs are. Right, but I mean, it, I hate to say yeah. you probably know most of them by their race just because they're different. I mean, it's it's awful to say, but I mean, there's nothing distinguishing about any of them. I mean, we it's interesting because in the beginning of the season they tried to give each of them a little more to do. Like um, one of the women went on an away mission with them, so we got a little moment more with her, and you know we got a, we got Irium went off on a mission, and and um and and Detmer did, and a few others like they had little bits more to do and then as soon as spock showed up they're like oh sorry we don't got time for this crap anymore and then we got a little I mean, we got the Arium episode but then we had um in the in the last the second to last episode when we, we had our big farewells when everyone like you know said we're gonna stand together and they sent their messages back home like we actually got a little more of that like oh wow she has a sister oh she had like you know we have we got those little bits of info there that we've been missing for two seasons i mean we're 29 episodes episodes in and we are 28 at that point 28 episodes in and i don't even know their names so i don't know i i'd like i hope we'll get some more time with them next season if anything that's what we said last season and they gave us a little more and then kind of gave up on it halfway through but instead we got lots of time with burnham and Spock. i mean sorry i was just oh, looking at the mm -hmm. website really quickly right. like and you look at just the wikipedia mm-hmm none of them <laughs> right <laughs> are even on the reoccurring characters thing it's interesting in the actual credits what they do is they give the cast then they give the guest stars like all the guest stars that includes even the bigger ones like laurel or you know the admiral or any of the others you know then after that we get also starring with, with the bridge crew and like the doctor and all of them appear that it's it's a weird way to do it and, and that's kind of how they pretty clearly think of these characters they're like less than the guest stars <laughs> Hopefully not next year. So Saru is still one of my favorite characters on the show. I love that he got his own short trek, so we got his little history, and that we took the time in the middle of the season to like free his people and all that. I mean, we already talked about a lot of that, but just love the character. I love his growth. I mean, they he's now ready to be even more so now without his you know ganglii threat ganglii. You can he's ready to be captain. I think. Of course, so is Burnham. So that'll be a, probably our big thing next season. No, see, I don't. I, I think they respect each other too much to fight over yeah. the captaincy. Maybe others will I, fight I on their that's... behalf. Maybe others will yeah. fight on their behalf. Sorry. Yeah, may maybe some will think that Suro is being too too rash maybe. because th there was times this season that I was like, Jesus, Suru, like give yourself a minute to think. Um, but yeah, but... I really enjoyed. I, I was actually afraid that he was going to die, and I'm like, did mm -hmm. someone cast Doug Jones in a film? Is this why I will not get right. through for the rest of the season? Right. I was so mm. worried, and then yeah, he came back badass. Have you great. ever noticed one thing I love about him as an actor? You know, he's had he's spent so much time in makeup and costumes and faces that you can't see him and all that that he knows how to use body language. Have you ever watched his body language as Saru walks, like the way his arms swing, very different from ours, and and the way he, t when he talks, like just everything about his body language is really fascinating. And I just, those little things that don't really add anything to the plot, but give us that sense of being alien and different. And I, I, I love that about it. For someone under so much, so much prosthetics, he's mm -hmm. able to give a, a knowing look and you know what he means. Oh yeah. It's, and, and I didn't realize that, yeah, it's all down to, to body language. He's. Mm, it's very well done. Um, I, I I loved when you see his quarters and he's just recreated his home yeah. and that beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. And when they were getting ready ready to evacuate, and he's just walking like looking around, and you're like, oh, I'll grab the knife and I'll go, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
So I was worried at some point in the in the season that um, Saru would like go bad uh, in in a way because uh, you gotta wonder if if he hasn't he doesn't have his um, um, what's the name the the thing that makes him experience fear. Um, what what's gonna like they they did almost play with that for for, for an episode or two like yeah. they, the idea that he could just have no morals whatsoever now, now that he doesn't have this Black um, Superman, spider-man even so what why do you think pike was hesitant to name the new commander like when everyone goes on to discovery that's going to go with michael because they're just awesome people and then there's this kind of weird thing where he just won't name saru captain even though we all know saru has to be captain because he's just a uh-huh. natural captain Figure. I don't know. That didn't even. Um, I that yeah. That didn't shock me. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I interpreted it m- more as um, like. Well, I don't even need to say it. It's obviously going to be Saru. Yeah, it didn't please me. I mean, I love. I love. Sar- I've loved Saru ever since season one. Whereas my Captain Pike ship is a new ship. <laughs> And what about Pike? I mean, Pike, to me, started off as... I I know a lot of people loved him. He started off, to me, as the very typical, like, sci-fi captain of a spaceship. You know, your typical guy with a typical kind of, I'm doing business as I'm supposed to. And and I'll admit, he really grew on me over the season, you know? I started out kind of not thrilled with him, and I admit that's probably my own biases, because I never was a fan of Kirk on the original show, so maybe that's part of it. But over time, I, I liked him, and I think... Certainly by the time he was, you know, by the time he went back to see his, see, you know, the, I forget the name of the planet there, uh, from the original episode. And also when he, you know, got the, uh, did the, got the time crystal. By that point, I was like, I was fully on board the bike train. I know, um, I know that Bina and Marie are totally fangirling over, over him. And I can see why now. If you'd asked me after two episodes, mm, but by the end, I liked him. And maybe we'll see more. I know that the producer know how much everyone loves him and they'd love to bring him back so I don't know if it's just going to appear on the Section 31 show maybe or if maybe they'll do a spinoff or a you know a miniseries or something with the Enterprise you just proof that Handsome doesn't work on everyone because I was on board from the get-go um, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah no I need a, all my thoughts of fangirl thoughts um, good fine I really enjoyed that he Oh, I keep saying I really enjoyed. It's okay. You I can enjoy found it fascinating things. that he was because he's like that dead, like down the line kind of captain, like obey mm-hmm. the rules. Right. And he showed that he was able to do both. Like he mm-hmm. could work within the system mm-hmm. with the rules that they have already been given right. uh, to do what needed to be done. Right. Which is which, which is kind of what they did all with of Picard. Star, no, but all like Star Trek, like season like season one, I felt was no, we need to break the rules. We need to break the rules. We need to break right. the rules. We need to break right. the rules right. by breaking every rule that they had to, they were completely justified because they won in the end and that was the right thing. Mm-hmm. But I liked Pike because he's like, no, I'm going to obey as many rules as I can and we're still going to come out on top because we followed the rules and because I can work within them. I feel like he a twisted reason. them and quite a like bit. That. As the season went on, he twisted them quite a bit. I mean, you know, I'm just, <laughs> let's them. just shut but... them off. Shut... I mean, you know, they ended up becoming fugitives. I mean, that's more than a twist, I think. I know, <laughs> I mean, but for the greater he... good, mind you, and, and rightfully so, but. But the way he did it was like, no, I'm going to be upright about this. I'm not just right, going to yeah. make a decision and hope the crew goes along with me. I'm going to right. say what we're doing. And if you're not on board, you're more than welcome to leave. Though, I mean, come on, it's Star Trek. No one's been... <laughs> would have no. been nice. It would have been nice to see that. Yeah. Actually, you know, the other one I really love is number one. So I re- as much as I'm jealous of her, because obviously Dreamy Captain Pike is only for me, the interaction between number one and Captain Pike is so cool. I really, really want a new series. I, I, yeah, exactly. I that. want a new Star Trek Discovery now. No, sorry, Star Trek Enterprise. Just because... I, I've got to say, my favorite parts of the season really were Pike and Spock and their interactions mm. uh, with the other characters. So I, I just, I'm really sad that they're not going to be in it anymore. Yeah. And I guess it's just, it's we could expect, we could have expected it, but I'm not happy about it. The question is whether there's enough money and enough boldness for the producers to create. They've already got the Picard series. 
So they've already got discoveries. That's two. Because all the fans have really been lobbying them on social media and saying, we really love Pike. We love the interaction with number one. We love Spock. And there was a there was a sort of response, I think, on Twitter from the showrunner saying, we have heard you and we'd love to explore more of these characters. So we'll see what we can do. I wonder if there's the sort of bravery and ambition with CBS or whoever owns these properties to kind of turn it into a Star Wars or Marvel type thing where you could have three different series running at once because I would genuinely say I'm as interested in Enterprise as I am in Discovery going forward now. And apparently they've got 10 years of timeline before Pike meets his untimely uh, fate that they could explore. So make it so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's already another show, right? Um, with Picard, that's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's going to be? All right. And I thought, but maybe that's the same thing. I thought there's, there was going to be a kind of a spin-off on Section 30, 31. Yeah, I think so, right? But I'm not sure if that's like a proper full-on series or... Um... Oh, just a few episodes. Um... Yeah. So the Untitled Picard series is um, by the same person who did a discovery, so Alex Kurtzman. It's set 18 years after the events of Star Trek Nemesis and is affected by blah, blah, blah. So the cursed, in- oh, the cursed, the cast includes Patrick Stewart, Evan Evagora, Alison Pill, Harry Treadaway. It's decent. And it comes on this autumn, I think, so... All right. Yeah. I'll look at for that for that. But yeah, a third a third series uh, seems kind of unlikely. I, I or maybe not not right now. Mm, that would make me sad though. I feel yeah. I feel I feel Pike needs to be on our screen. Come back to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, although it would be weird seeing him interacting with number one because obviously jealousy, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> better Pike flirting with number one than not on my screen at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh dear. I did do an in memoriam section for Admiral Cornwall and Area. I'm not sure there's much yeah. to say there other than farewell good characters. In memoriam, Admiral Cornwall, did you not see that sacrifice coming a mile away? Love the character, by the way, but that, I saw that coming. The moment she started walking down, I'm like, oh, she's gone. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did not like her in season one, and I really liked her this season. Um, they gave her much more to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a, a lot of what she had to do was exp- exposition anyway and, and setting plot stuff in motion. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, the conversation that she had with Colbert, mm-hmm. I I really enjoyed. I, I That was, I think, the best scene for both of those two characters mm-hmm. um, of, of her explaining how the world really works to him in the situation mm-hmm. that he's in. But, yeah, I, I saw her sacrificing herself as soon as she's, yeah, off the bridge. It was going to happen. You know, I mean, both of our sacrifices were very, very Star Trek. Like it wasn't Game of Thrones where like, oh, he got killed in a, you know, in a boating accident or, you know, drowned on coffee or betrayed by someone. It's nope, nope. They're going to heroically save everyone, you know. And then, of course, the other one is was Ariam, who, again, once we once we started with like her history and her as a like human and her past, I was like, OK, we know she's dying this episode, but especially the moment it became a like, oh, some. Someone has to save the day. We're like, yep, it's going to be her. She's gone. Bye-bye. Exactly. It was... Her story was interesting, but once again, I just did not care. Right. I wanted... Like, I think if we'd had two more episodes where we actually, I don't know, knew her name, knew what she did. Like, if we did any... Like, any of that stuff with, like, her and Tilly and that background, if we'd had that... If you'd cut those scenes out and put them in, like, two weeks before and three weeks before, I might have cared more now. But it's all suddenly, like... You know, it's like same thing on Walking Dead. When a character starts to become interesting, you know they're going to die. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not like they didn't have time to just add a minute or there was a... F- <sighs> to the benefit, I think there might have been one or two times in the background where you saw them interacting. Mm-hmm. But if you if you heard snippets of conversation and how friendly it actually was until it was um, Arium going through her memories and keeping the ones of mm-hmm. her friends... Um, that was also right. really cool to show how yes. how her enhancements worked. Mm-hmm. Uh. And and I did like the fact that they gave her a few weeks of like, is she going to go bad or not or whatever? Like, I did like that little subplot, even if they didn't do much with it until that one episode. Like, I, I wish they'd kind of like built it up a little more. Yeah. And the other thing that they didn't build up is how people are treated with enhancements because mm-hmm. yep. uh, what's the pilot's name with the, the Y? Detmer. 
Yes. So the she, only one whose name I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, she said it at, at, at Ariam's mm-hmm. funeral. Like she she taught me to not hate my enhancements. Right. I thought that was enha- enhancements were a choice. Right. I had thought they so made too. her better at yeah. her job. Mm-hmm. And at no point was there any like you know pantsing the person with mm-hmm. enhancements because right. you don't like people with enhancements. I didn't get that at all. Yeah. Like, it would have made maybe a little bit of sense if we'd seen it or heard about it. Right. But also, why would people care about enhancements that far in the future. Right. I'm going to get a brain As- ship in like As- 25 years when they become available. Mm-hmm. Especially in this Star Trek in. world. I mean, this is a Star Trek world where there's no discrimination and there's no hatred and all that happy stuff. So of, of, of all things to be that like they're, that people think of you badly, like that just seems weird given that we don't have Or do they just feel, yeah, or do they just feel about themselves badly because they are now less human? Maybe. Or they see themselves as less human and it, it, it and it, it's all Maybe. self-hatred and, and not yeah. external. Right. I get the you impression don't get any this, of that. I get the impression this is kind of a new thing in their culture, so maybe that's part of it. But it would have been nice to have, I don't know, three sentences of background would have been nice. By the way, I, speaking of background, here's an interesting background about the whole Irium story. So I don't know if you know this. I didn't know this until I was reading about it, actually. Uh, when I was, I was actually, remember how we said we're trying to figure out who these people are in the characters earlier? Like, I don't know who any of them are. I was just looking at um, IMDb and realized that Irium was actually recast after the first season. But here's where it gets really interesting, and this might have something to do with why they killed the character off. So, the original a- actress was named Sarah Mitich. I may not be pronouncing that correctly, but um, and then at the end of the first season she was replaced by Hannah Chesna. But, here's the interesting thing. There was another character. The same actress who played Iriam in the first season has a new supporting role in the second season as Lieutenant Nielsen who, um, I think helps Gilly and I mean, sorry, helps Tilly in one of the first early episodes. Um, but here's the weird part. After Arium dies, her character, this new, this, this Lieutenant Nilsson, takes Arium's place on the bridge. So the same actress is now in the same place as a different character. Isn't that odd? That's weird. Why couldn't they just keep her for the same one? It's not like they ever interacted. Well, I think I think honestly what it was was I'm I'm guessing that it was one of those things where I mean let's face it there was a lot of makeup and a lot of that and you know maybe she either couldn't do it or didn't want to or maybe even had like an allergic reaction or something and so they decided to keep her because they liked the actress and then like replaced her in her own spot though that's the interesting twist to it all. <laughs> Or realizes realize that she didn't have the emotional range to portray like Arium in that big episode, and realized that they signed uh, her on for two seasons, so you needed to find a replacement. That's hypothetical. Maybe. I'm not saying anything maybe. against that actress, but right. that's how my brain goes. Now, I I feel like it was more like a, they wanted to keep her around, but she couldn't do the makeup anymore. I I don't know though because they haven't talked about it at all. They've said that she replaced her, and I've read interviews with them saying like how she gave her advice on how to run the how to, how to play the character and all that. Um, because they were both on set because they're both continued on the show. But like I don't know if that's ever happened before where a character changes parts and the other character oh, her other cars must... continues that's yeah it's probably really bad i mean I, I imagine like it could be like three hours of makeup and it could be painful and awful i mean you have things in your eyes i mean i wouldn't want to do that especially when no one knew oh, man. You... did you even notice did you notice thing, she changed like, no no not, nope, not at, at all. all but like if it is if it is for makeup like god your skin must be falling off because they can be quite mm-hmm. they, they try the best for makeup mm-hmm. and prosthetics now yeah, but, but it's everyone, to have an no allergic who reaction, does it, everyone and who does so it says much it's of your hard. face. Everyone who like. does that kind of makeup stuff says it's really tough. So you know, whatever. Expectations for season three of Discovery: Uncharted Water. There's no canon, right? They're rock so far into the future. They can kind of do whatever they want. Is that exciting or somewhat petrifying? I don't know. I think it's exciting. Well, one um, obvious question is, will they find um, Michael's mom? And (gasps) will she be a part of of the show? I hope so, because the actress who plays her was one of the lead actresses on The Wire, which is one of my all-time favourite TV shows. And I got such a... I think the way in which um, some of the fans felt seeing Spock return, like, (gasps) you know, that's how I felt seeing her. (laughs) (laughs) I was so excited. So I would love that. Um, You know what I was thinking about Discovery is, is that if you look at the current crew, there aren't any white males on it, on the bridge. I mean, Stamets is there, but he's not a bridge officer, right? So that's yeah. kind of unusual. That's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but like, yeah, I was like, well, Saru may be captain, but he's an alien. And then there's a lot of women on there, and I was like, where are the blokes? Does it matter? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, something to yeah. think about. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm so excited about season three. Right. Anything else anyone else wanted to talk about? I mean, do we want to talk more about Pike? Why do you love Pike so much? Is Pike the best captain of all? 
<laughs> I don't know. It's just it's just dreamy, Captain Dreamy, you know. It's weird. I think it's definitely down to the costume department's hair and makeup department's haircut because he. I actually then realised that Hell on Wheels is on Amazon, so I can watch that for free. I'd never seen this actor before, but apparently he was the star of that Western show. Yeah. And I started watching it, and he has like long, shaggy hair, and he has a southern accent. I was like, you are not hot in this. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's also the way his character is written. Uh, he's very, um, he's very charming, and at the same time, just really just normal guy uh, with a lot of charisma and um, uh, kind of always um, a smile or a joke um, uh, at least in his eyes, and I like that. But genuinely a good guy, and I and I was saying yeah. to a friend of mine that I think there's something about the authority figure who's genuinely a good guy that is very attractive. So we don't get many mm-hmm. of those. Like, and he's so when he first came on onto the screens, I actually didn't like him because he was a bit too smarmy and charming and a bit too good looking. And I thought, oh, is he going to become a Captain Kirk kind of cheesy guy who gets the girl, gets the alien on every planet? But they managed to restrain it and really bring him back in. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, he's decent. Um, all right everyone hopefully you enjoyed uh me and mary and jock discussing star trek discovery season two hopefully you've also enjoyed hearing the thoughts of david hhh who is really far more of an authority on this and dana um you didn't find the kind of chopping back and forth too um disjointed and disturbing and hopefully we will be back to talk to you about the picard spin-off series season three of disco and maybe maybe if we um lobby social media enough a new enterprise season so thank you very much for joining um Thank yeah yeah thanks mary thanks rock <laughs> thanks Bina. Yeah. and yeah we'll hopefully speak we'll to see you, see you all you. soon yeah, i was about to say yeah. may the force be with you but what's the star trek one uh we can do the the, the vulcan sign but it's not gonna show and the... <laughs> live long and prosper thanks for listening to our half of the conversation again i'm david And I'm Donna. Live long and prosper. Yes, please do. And hopefully we'll see you all next season. Bye.